summer at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And today is another great day here, everybody. You know, we've been open 23 years and 12 million people have come here to experience rock and roll. Isn't that phenomenal? We're having 60 days of live music out front. We just opened a new exhibition about rock and roll and pinball downstairs. We have rock and roll and television upstairs. But today is a special day because we have two Rock and Roll Hall of Fame inductees in the house. And I'm going to bring on, from Sirius Satellite Radio, Rachel Steele. She will bring on our two Rock and Roll Hall of Fame inductees. Um, oh, come on up, Rachel. Rachel Steele, everybody. You know what? We'll bring them up. I'll bring them up. Rachel, grab your seat. Uh, we're so honored that uh, from Alice Cooper, we have the amazing, amazing bass player, songwriter, collaborator. Just think about, you know, Under My Wheels and songs like that. The great Dennis Dunaway. Dennis, come on up, Dennis. Cooper, who we all know as Alice Cooper. Just think about schools out, billion dollar babies, huh? Um, Be my lover, 18. Let me keep going. Let's just bring him on. 2011 Harker Hall of Fame inductee, Alice Cooper. So it's, it's kind of like a throwback to the 50s and 60s. And for some reason, it's a lot more fun, you know, uh, to get a pinball. This is the loudest pinball machine you've ever heard in your life. I mean, it's, it's probably too loud. Kids will love it. <laughs> no such thing as too loud, is there? <laughs> too loud, you're too old! You'll never hear Dennis or I ever say, turn that down. So, are you any good? No. No. Actually, I have a Dr. Dude at home. And uh, I played that for quite, I got really addicted to that for quite a long time. And then they showed me this one, and it was, you know, technology was so much further uh, gone with this one that it makes, it makes those machines look kind of archaic. Uh, and who knows where it's going to go from there. What's the, the creepiest thing that you have inside of the Alice Cooper pin? I haven't even been to level two on, okay. on, on this thing. Uh, but you keep getting different levels on it and it keeps getting more complicated and more dangerous, I guess. I wanted it to make it so that if you actually hit one thing, you would actually get a shock and knock you back eight feet. <laughs> That's an idea. That's an Alice Cooper machine right there. <laughs> and they couldn't pull that off? They couldn't do that. They would say something legal about it. I don't know. <laughs> Is there a... Is there anything inside the pinball machine that you were able to do that you haven't been able to pull off on stage? 90% of it. Oh, really? <laughs> okay. Details. Well, no. I mean, you know, when you're talking about the stage thing, when we first started, uh, we built our own props. In fact, if you go down to the, to the uh, uh, exhibit down there, you'll see the original electric chair. And Dennis built the electric chair in, in the garage. So, and at that time, that was high tech, because nobody had ever seen anything, you know, theatrical on stage before. So an electric chair, and Dennis told the story about driving it with a, on top of the car. 
Well, yeah, we got reactions with it on stage, of course, because uh, the dramatic lighting and, of course, Alice sitting in the chair with the pocket watch swinging back and forth, hypnotizing everybody, and then ripping open the feather pillow and blasting it all over the room. And so, so it got a lot of attention that way, but it also got a lot of attention when we would be driving down the freeway in the Midwest and people would come by looking at the car pointing at the top because we'd have the electric chair strapped to the top of the station wagon. <laughs> That's what I was thinking. And where do you get the parts to start building an electric chair? Well, we didn't have any money, so we just picked up some lumber that happened to be in the garage and we, there were some tacks there and the, the headpiece that goes over the head, uh, it, was, it was actually on the, on the light on the ceiling of the garage. We got a ladder and got up and swiped it off the garage and, and it, that's still the one that's on the electric chair that's in the exhibit. That's excellent. And you, how old were you? What, what period was this when you started to build this? Were you still living at home? Oh no, this was uh, 70, 70, 71, so the band was all living together. Okay. But you know, we didn't. We were barely able to feed ourselves, so anything that you were going to put on stage was going to have to be homemade. Right. And we still keep it that way. You know, I mean, if you would go to see the show now, the toy box is built backstage because I don't want it to look high tech. I want everything to look like it was homemade, yeah. and it gives it that vaudeville look. Mm -hmm. You know, that sort of uh, it's, it's it's just a little bit more organic that way than, rather than have it all slick. Right, and you don't want anything fancy up there. No, I want it to look like, you know, a little kid's bedroom with a big toy box, except things are coming out of the toy box that shouldn't be coming out of the toy box. Right, absolutely. So you started building, you've known each other for, since, how old were you? 15, 16. Okay, and all of a sudden you started building electric chairs. Well, did, first the band well, started. The band yeah. started, and yeah. then you started the props. What did your parents think? At that point. This is what it was. Dennis and I were both on the track and cross country team. Okay. And we were both, you know, four year lettermen in cross country. Oh, wow, and, that's and, impressive. Uh, so we were athletes. <laughs> <laughs> this was in Phoenix, Arizona, so our brains were kind of fried from the sun. Right. Three of the guys in the original band were four year lettermen. So we were jocks. And we were in a band, which didn't make any sense at all, because at the time we, we were in you know, the Beatles had just come out, and we decided to start a band. And the very first show we ever did in high school, there was a guillotine and a coffin on stage. And we had, that was, that, that, that somehow was a precursor to what was going to be happening. Right. We had giant spider webs. Uh, Alice and I had made uh, tombstones and coffins out of refrigerator boxes and painted it. And we, we had a guy that would come out of the coffin between songs and do some shtick and then get back in the coffin. <laughs> the reason is we did not understand the concept of a set list. So we would be discussing what song we wanted to do next and this guy would go and entertain the audience until we decided that he'd get back in the coffin, we'd do another song. And it's still not a bad idea. That's phenomenal. So your, your parents, did they think anything was strange was happening? Like what's going on with my children? My dad was a pastor. Okay. And he said, hey, I dig the music. My dad could tell you who played bass for the animals, you know. Um, and he says, I dig the music. I dig, I understand. I get the Alice Cooper thing. I get it. He said, I can't condone sleeping around and taking drugs and, and drinking. He says, but the music and the theatrics, I got no problem with. So we had a really good relationship. That's yeah, excellent. My, my his, his dad actually got the band's first paying gig at a bar next to the high school that's still there, the Oasis Bar. Oh, wow. oh really? Yeah, yeah. We were way too young to be there, but we were there. Have you been back since to, to play uh, there? I, not to play there, but I did stop by there within the last year. And, uh, nobody in there had any clue that we ever <laughs> played there, of course. <laughs> Dennis, now with this pinball machine that's here, did you have any? Did you have any say so in it? Did you help design it? No, no, no. This was all Alice working with the people that uh, created the machine. Okay. And then another piece in the exhibit is an Andy Warhol. Is it a silkscreen print? Or? It's, uh, yeah, it's the electric chair. It's, uh, this is the funniest story. Um, back in 1971, I got this 
we saw Andy Warhol all the time. He was at Studio 54 or he was at uh, Max's Kansas City. We lived in New York at the time. So we, it was very common to see Andy Warhol. And we saw that he had an electric chair. That was his, one of his things. And it was my birthday, so I got the electric chair as a birthday present. And it was, I think, $2,000 at the time. And I had it, and I hung it up, and it was nice, and blah, blah, blah. And, and, and we moved to Los Angeles, so I had it rolled up and put into a, you know, a tube. And totally forgot about it. So 35 years later, I, I was talking to Dennis Hopper, and Dennis Hopper says, hey, I just sold one of my Andy Warhols for $12 million. And I went, oh. <laughs> what? And, he, and I said, I think I have one. I can, I can just vision him frantically digging through the garage. <laughs> No, I had 12 people in there. It's in here somewhere. We pulled it out, and I called up Shep, and Shep says, um, this is an original Andy Warhol. I went, yeah. And he goes, okay. <laughs> so it was a great find. I'm going to start selling tickets to my garage. You get to go in for five minutes, anything you find, you get to keep. I'll be there. I'll be there. Um, so... I want to uh, recognize your wife here. How long have you been married? Cheryl and I have been married. Stand up, Cheryl. 42 years. That's Cindy, nice. right there. Cindy and Dennis have been married for how long? 43 years. Wow. 43 years. Now, how do you... And yesterday was Cindy's birthday. Oh, She's from okay. Ohio. Neil Smith is her sister. <laughs> I know, she gets mad because everybody says she's Neil Smith's sister, so I turned it around for her. Uh, Cindy was, uh, was basically took care of the house when the band lived together. And I don't know how she did it, but somehow she provided food every night. Anything that got torn, now she comes in and tears everything, you know, because you have to have torn stuff. And, but I mean, we survived because Cindy took care of us for a very, very long time, so. She's, she's a family forever. And isn't it nice that we're such good guys that we stay married for 42 years? Yeah. Well, that's what I was yeah. going to say. How do you pull that off in this business? Let me back here on the back. Okay. How do you pull that off in this business? I mean, it's, it's very few and far in between. Yeah, it's, you know, I, I'm telling you, it's, I always tell people, keep the romance in the marriage. You know, I treat Cheryl like she's my girlfriend. So, you know. That's beautiful. Whisk her off to a cheap motel on a yeah. Tuesday. <laughs> hey, that'll keep them around. Uh, now, going back to very early, Frank Zappa signed you. Yeah. He wanted to change your name to Alice Cookies. Yes. Can you tell me more about that? I want to know how that conversation went. Well, the one thing about, about Frank was, Frank, the, the, one of the greatest compliments that we ever got was that we showed up at Frank's house. He said, be here at seven. We got there at seven in the morning. And we were in chrome pants, and then we started, it was in the log cabin. And we started playing our songs. Now we had five songs that were a minute and a half, maybe two minute songs, that had 28 changes in it. And Frank's down in there with his coffee and his cigarette. And he finally goes, I don't get it. And I said, is that good? And he goes, yeah, I'll sign you because I don't get it. Oh, that's fantastic. So anytime you can get Frank Zappa to say, I don't get it, <laughs> that was very important because every other record company had turned us down. Frank saw a little something in us that could happen, that, that may happen. There was, there was a spark of creativity there that nobody, that he had never seen. And uh, it went on, you know. So he had us over for our first meeting uh, and his wife was upstairs cooking cookies for us. And we're thinking, we're sitting in the kitchen thinking, well, we gotta wait while she's making cookies for the meeting? Okay, well. And then we go downstairs and Frank is all excited about this idea. Hi, Alice Cookies. And we're like, what? <laughs> but we were used to entertaining crazy ideas, so we went along with it, but he was inspired. It was, he wanted to have each record be the size of a cookie and come in its own tuna fish can and stack so you had to, and stack on the counter of the record store and you needed a can opener to get each cookie out to play it. 
and you know still a good idea <laughs> well you know yeah it's a good idea but the funny thing is in retrospect is at the time we thought nobody's going to take us seriously with that <laughs> well you know that, that was the that was kind of the interesting thing was that if you ask yourself when you see the alice cooper show the how much time do they spend on each if it was an eight hour rehearsal seven hours was on the music because that was the cake. And then the other hour was on the theatrics, which came more natural to us. It actually was, it was sort of natural for us to do the theatrics, so we didn't really have to work at it. But most, most people would say, well, they do you know, five hours on the theatrics and a little time on the music. We were competing with Led Zeppelin. We were competing with, you know, The Who and people like that. So you had to make records then that were as good as their records and then do the show on top of it. Right. You, but if you didn't have those songs, you were just a puppet show. Right. So we'd spend a couple weeks writing a song like we wrote Is It My Body to go with we wanted this bump and grind feel for to introduce the snake into the show. And so we spend weeks getting this song just the way we liked it and then we play it live and then we read about the snake. <laughs> yeah, the snake got all the, you know, the attention because of course the visual is gonna take the attention over. So for years, we were not considered a, a musical band. And because the theatrics were so powerful and it got so much attention and the parents hated us so much, you know, that that got all the attention. When the record starts going to number one and number two and everything, then everybody has to start noticing the songs. Right. At that point, that's, that's the Willy Wonka golden ticket is, is actually having hit records. Right. And then you were inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 2011. Yay. Yay. That's, that's, we got some future ones right over there. Rob Zombie and his boys are over there. Yes! Let's hear it for them. You'll be seeing them in here. How did you how did you feel? What what was the, the initial thought that went through your mind when you realized that you were uh, going to be inducted? Both of you. It, you know, it was uh, I, I didn't really have a problem with not being, you know, I, I thought there was still that stigma of is it musical or isn't it musical until somebody brought up the point that we had had so many hit records, we'd had 14 top 40 records and that got everybody's attention again and then we got voted in which was great, you know, it's, it's, that's, that's always nice to be voted in. The funniest thing about our inauguration thing when we got in, it was, we, it was the weirdest year, it was Dr. John, Tom Waits, uh, and then Neil Diamond. Oh, wow. And Alice Cooper. And Neil Diamond got up, was just a little sloshed. And we were all happy, you know, yeah, this is great. Rob, Rob introduced us, actually, did the whole thing. And Neil got up and goes, ah, should have been in here 20 years ago. <laughs> you know? And it was like so funny because he was so drunk. In his defense, he had flown all night from Australia to get there. But and he saved it with Sweet Caroline. He stole the show. Actually. Everybody was on the tables going, yeah, okay, great. But it was so funny to see Neil Diamond, who was squeaky clean, kind of just pissed off. Yeah, that, you, yeah you would not expect that whatsoever. Uh, so, retirement. Do you think about retirement at all? Retirement? That doesn't even come up in the, uh, the conversation. No. My mom says if you retire, you expire. So. How can you retire when you're only 12? Yeah, right. <laughs> Mentally, we're 12 years old, so... No, there's never even been mention of retirement. Good for you. In fact, at 70, now I'm in two bands. <laughs> My band and the Vampires, so I'm touring twice as much now. Good for you. That's and, fantastic. Uh, yeah. Last year... Last year, if you were lucky enough to be in London, the original band played in London. Uh, we would do the regular show and then it, we stopped the show and the curtain comes down and when the curtain came up it was Neil, Dennis, Mike and myself and we did like four or five songs and the audience loved it. It was just one of those things where it was a great moment where you know the original guys could get together. Of course Glenn passed away uh, and uh, Ryan, I think Ryan played, you know, Ryan Roxy played for us but uh, it was like years had not gone by. It was exact, I knew exactly what, where they were going musically with it. Dennis plays exactly the same way he did then, Neil does, Mike does, so it, it was really interesting to go back to that era. 
So we played to 14,000 people or so at Wembley, and the last time the original group had played there was 72. Yes. And we sold it out that time because Chef Gordon had a truck break down in the, one of the major intersections in London, and it had a big poster of Alice who was only wearing the snake. <laughs> and, uh, and we were on every news channel, and uh, the next night, suddenly, Wembley was sold out. What do you know? <laughs> hey, whatever it takes, that's fantastic. Well, thank you so much for, uh, for coming to visit us today. Thank coming you. Back to the Rock Wall. Cleveland Rocks. <laughs> Check out the pinball machine downstairs in the new exhibit, part of the machine, Rock and Pinball. Dennis Dunaway and Alice Cooper. Thank you so much. Yeah.